Hi, and welcome to another episode of Blue Coat Talks. I am very, very excited to be coming to you today to talk all about one of my absolutely favorite things in the whole world, which is sea jellies. I know, sea jellies in Northern Ontario. Why would we ever talk about that? Well, it's because one of the thing, reasons is I think that we are all connected to our world's oceans. So whether or not you head to your local river, whether or not you head to your local lake, we are all connected to our oceans in one way or another. So just introduce myself. My name is Amy Henson. I am a staff scientist at Science North, and I am super excited to be talking today with Sophie Wolven from the Ripley's Aquarium of Canada located in Toronto. She is the lead aquarist um, for the sea jellies exhibits that they have there and she is going to take us on some incredible behind the scenes tours of some of the ways that she takes care of jellies at that aquarium. So I'm gonna bring her on, welcome her in. So come on in Sophie and welcome and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at the Whipley's Aquarium of Canada. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Sophie. Uh, yes, as mentioned, I'm the lead aquarist for uh, some of our jellyfish exhibits. Um, we do have a whole team that works on the jellies, but uh, I'm sort of the head of that team. Uh, I primarily take care of our largest species of jelly, the Pacific sea nettle, as well as working on a lot of the baby jellyfish, uh, a lot of breeding and culturing of the baby jellies in the building. That is so good. So this is, I think this is kind of the neatest thing about uh, jellies at aquariums is that you don't just go out to the ocean and grab a whole bunch of sea jellies and bring them in and like, and that's where they live or whatever. You actually breed them right at the aquarium, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing about jellies, even uh, in the wild, they are certainly only seen certain times of the year. So being able to breed all our own jellies, being able to keep them in house, uh, it's super great uh, just to be able to have them on hand. That's amazing. That's amazing. So. Can you tell us, I think, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and how did you ever even become an aquarist at the Ripley's Aquarium? Because I think for a lot of people out there, I think that is a dream job by far. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I came here sort of by a bit of a strange route. Um, I know a lot of people end up in marine biology through uh, following that career throughout school and all of that. Um, I did go to my undergrad for biology, uh, but I actually studied evolutionary biology and paleontology, which is like dinosaurs. Uh, and then I kind of moved from there into more of a diving, scuba diving uh, field. And then I ended up here. Uh, I started as a diver and slowly worked my way up uh, until I was in jellies and then the lead of jellies. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. As a Paleo, as a background with paleontology, jellies don't leave behind really good fossil records, right? <laughs> yeah, there are very few jellyfish fossils, although I do get very excited when I see them still. Uh, so <laughs> I actually don't even know if I've seen a jellyfish fossil. So you're not gonna have to you're gonna have to show me one of those at some point. Yeah, at some point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Things with, with things with without bones don't generally do well in the fossil record, but we do Yeah. Need you need so perfect on. conditions. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're in a very yellow room right now. So I'm really <laughs> yeah. curious as to where you are, if you want to take us through, like, what, am, what are we looking at behind you? Yeah, of course. So uh, the room I'm in right now is um, sort of our main jellyfish backup area. Uh, so the behind the scenes of several of our jellyfish tanks. Um, it's actually located above uh, our big sea nettle wall, which is sort of like our uh, crowning achievement at the aquarium is our giant sea jelly tank. Um, so yeah, we can go through the room and we can check out some of the stuff that's in here. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Go. Yeah. So uh, since we were just talking about the sea nettle tank, uh, we can head over there and I can show it to you from above. So as you can see, the tank is quite long, uh, kind of all the way over to the wall over there. And then if we look inside, uh, we can see some jellyfish. Jellies! <laughs> yeah. So this is our Pacific Sea Nettle Tank. It's about 18 feet deep and 24 feet long. So, but as you can see, it's only about a foot and a half wide. Um, so yeah, a lot of our, uh, 
a lot of jellyfish tanks actually do better if they're narrower. Um, jellies require pretty specific flow uh, in order to keep them off the bottom and off the sides because uh, jellyfish in the wild would never actually interact with a wall or a corner or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, so the shape of the tank is one of the most important things to taking care of jellyfish. Um, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're big jellies too, right? Yeah, so they can grow to about, uh, they, their arms can actually grow to almost uh, 30 feet long, uh, but they grow around 60 inches, uh, 60 centimeters wide. Yeah. That's fantastic. And so what yeah. is, what's the biggest jelly that you have in there right now? Like how big is it? Yeah, so the biggest one we have in there right now is probably uh, longer than I am tall, and I'm five foot five inches, so very long. And uh, the bell, which is that top part of the body, uh, is probably around a foot and a half. Wow. Which is pretty big, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. This is yeah. fantastic. I'm so happy that you're taking us through here. And I have so many questions about jelly of course. <laughs> and, and especially about jelly care, because I think that is really neat. But online, if you're tuning in right now and you want to ask Sophie a question about jellies or how she takes care of them, she's more than happy <laughs> to do that. So you can put your questions into the comments and I'll see them pop up and we'll sort of ask it as we, as we kind of go along. So, so thank for your questions you can put them right in the comments and uh and i'll take them to sophie so that, that's that's fantastic so what kind of so what kind of other things do you have to do to take care of a jelly inside of an aquarium besides like yeah flies? yeah so the flow is of course like the first step right you got to have a tank that works well for the jellies um the next most important thing is food so jellies will eat in the wild they'll eat constantly uh, they don't really have a way to store a lot of reserves. So they're just constantly pulling food out of the water on those frilly arms. Uh, those central arms are the, where all the stinging cells are. And that's how they catch prey, usually microscopic prey, though uh, the Pacific sea nettles, those big ones we just looked at, they will actually eat fish and even other jellyfish. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So anything they can catch, uh, as long as the venom is strong enough to kind of mo immobilize the prey, they will eat it. Wow. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. In terms of the food that we feed the jellies here, though, I can also show that. So right here, we have these two very tall towers that are bubbling. Um, and they are actually full of eggs. Uh, and so those eggs, uh, the brown color comes from the eggs. They're microscopic little eggs. Um, and those are brine shrimp eggs. And so every day we start a whole tower uh, and one whole tower will go out to feed the jellies for the day. And so the food for the day, when it comes out, you can see is quite orange. Uh, and so if we can get a good look at it over here, let's see. Oh yeah. You can see, them. yeah, all those little guys swimming around. So those are microscopic little uh, brine shrimp. They are alive. Uh, because jellies need live food in order to do their best. Uh, the food will stay up in the water because it's swimming around and they can just pull it out as they eat it. Ah, uh, that is so, so it's a constant like making and, and with, and with, um, with brine shrimp, they like those eggs can stay dormant for a really long time. Right. So you're, you're yeah. just, you know, making a whole new, a whole batch of new brine exactly. shrimp and, and just growing them a little bit and then off they go to feed the jellies. Yep. That is yeah. really neat. Yeah, so, we actually get them freeze dried in a can and we put them in the water and start growing them right away. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So we talked about this is a question just come in, Sophie. This is kind of funny. So we we've talked about what sea jellies and jellyfish can eat, but can we as humans eat jellyfish? Yeah, so uh it depends on the species. Um humans actually do eat certain species of jellyfish. There is a jellyfish whose common name is the edible jellyfish. Uh, it's commonly prepared uh, more in uh, Asian countries, uh, but it's all in the marinade, really. Uh, they don't taste like much. They're, they have a bit of a strange texture if you're not used to it, but people definitely do eat jellies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, and then we talked about um, the arms of the jellyfish that have all of those stinging cells that on it so we had a question because you're a diver have you ever been stung by a jellyfish yourself 
Uh, yes, I have many times. <laughs> um, we do we do have gloves, uh, reusable gloves, all over the place uh, that we use, especially because the Pacific sea nettles, of all the species we have, they do have the strongest thing, which is a venom, uh, more like a bee sting than like it's not electricity or anything like that. Um, but uh, they don't actually they aren't dangerous. Uh, it will hurt and I'll regret it, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, like I know that when I've been out swimming in the ocean, I've been stung by some of the jellies of like that we have in the North Atlantic as an example, and they don't sting nearly as much. They sting. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like they go away after a couple of hours, but I know yeah. there, are some, there are definitely some um, jellies out there that sting, the who sting is a lot, lot more, lot more. Yes more severe right yeah yeah so uh we i do get stung by the nettles more often than i should honestly but uh we do have a kit a venom kit for the jelly specifically um a lot of people usually ask what do you do for a jellyfish sting uh the best thing is vinegar so it's vinegar yeah so if you have vinegar with you that is by far and away the best thing to put on a jellyfish sting immediately you want to stay away from things like fresh water or um, really anything other than vinegar, <laughs> alcohol and fresh water. People usually think help, but they don't. Yeah. Uh, so we, we've often heard the myth that you should pee on somebody when they get yeah. stuck. <laughs> so that's probably not the best idea. Probably not that. Um, the thing is, is that heat will help. So that's the only way urine would help okay. <laughs> is if it's warm. <laughs> so good to know that's yeah good know. i get that question a lot so there you go there you go so being in toronto and having the ripley's aquarium of canada in toronto there's one thing that i think people have a big question about and one of our viewers definitely asked this because we're not toronto's nowhere near an ocean it's on lake yeah. ontario which is fresh water <laughs> very very different than if let's say we we're on the atlantic or the pacific ocean so where and how do you get seawater into all of the tanks? Because they are huge. That's a lot of seawater. Yeah. So um, we have to mix our own synthetic salt water. Um, so basically what happens is that we fill a 35,000 gallon basin with fresh water from the city water, Toronto city water, that's been filtered a little bit further so that uh, we don't have to worry about anything being in it. And then we basically just add bags and bags and bags of different kinds of salts. So the main one is table salt, uh, NACL, kind of the standard salt you would find on your kitchen table. Uh, but then we'll add other things like magnesium, calcium, uh, all the things uh, sea creatures need to survive. The seawater is not just made up of um, sodium chloride, like the table salt. It has lots of other different kinds yeah. of salt well right yeah and, so, and some of them are just in small tiny wee little amounts but they are super important right exactly yeah some of our salts that we have to add will add you know to thirty-five thousand gallons of water we'll add about like six grains of rubidium and that's super important you can't forget it <laughs> but amazing. yeah <laughs> amazing oh my goodness so what else is in that room that you're you're hosting yeah us? take us around yes so the other thing I would like to show you in this room is our other tank. Uh, so this one right here, also in the floor, is our one of our moon jellyfish exhibits. So you can see the tank is circular. Um, our moon jellies do really well in this exhibit. And if you were to come to the aquarium, this tank would actually be in the ceiling. So even though it's in the floor of where I am right now, you would have to look up to see it. Um, so we have quite a few moon jellyfish in the aquarium, uh, and they are sort of the hardiest jellyfish. Uh, they also have the weakest venom, so you could touch them all you wanted and they wouldn't really sting at all. Although you can develop an allergy to them, which some people don't know, but uh, they get very itchy after some time. Right. Um, that so is yeah. beautiful. And one of the questions that we have coming in right now is about the lighting that you have in the two aquariums in this one and in the sea nettle one. Is there a reason for the type of lighting? Is it just to showcase them more or do they need like a, a, a certain kind of light light for them to survive? Yeah, so um, several species of jellyfish uh, do require specific light. Mm. Um, here, I'll switch this back around. 
Uh, for our moon jellies and for our Pacific sea nettles, they don't require any specific type of type of light. As long as they have that light cycle of day night, they do perfectly fine with any kind of light. Um, but then some of our species of jellyfish, like our upside down jellyfish, they actually have algae that lives inside of them. Uh, and so they need a specific kind of light. So I don't have an example of the light, but I do have one of our upside downs up here, uh, <laughs> just sitting in a little container. He's hanging out. Um, yeah, you can see him pulsing. Uh, so that blue inside of his oral arms, mm -hmm. that's algae. So for him, uh, he would not do well if there were no good lights on him. So we have to have lights that mimic sunlight uh, so that he can produce the food he needs. Wow, that's neat. So he produces his own food with the algae that lives inside of him. Yeah. Yeah. That is so neat. Yeah. <laughs> No wonder yeah, he's up pretty cool. now, right? I know. So most people expect jellyfish always to be swimming around. Um, but the upside down jellies, they actually do better on the bottom. They just sit there. They hang out uh, under sunlight. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we, I, one of the next question came in is, do the algae feed the jelly? And yeah, absolutely. So they do. Is, yeah. The jellyfish. Cool. Yeah. The jellyfish does still need to catch food. So we will still feed him. Uh, the brine shrimp, but uh, he will produce some of his own food with the algae. That's really neat. That's really yeah. Neat. So I have a, so another question that's come in is about why do jellyfish sting? What's the like? What's the reason why they have those those stingers? Yeah. So uh, jellyfish and their sting kind of go back a really long way uh, in evolutionary history. They kind of found a good way to catch prey and never really changed it. Um, so. <laughs> The mechanism is sort of like a specialized cell and inside that cell is almost like a little harpoon on a spring. And so when something touches that cell, it springs out, injects the venom and actually holds onto the prey. Um, and so the reason they sting uh, is first to catch prey. It's a very efficient way to catch prey and hold it and then be able to consume it at their leisure. Uh, but the other reason is that it protects them from predators. So a predator coming up uh, will get stung and immediately decide, I don't like this, and back away. So two good reasons. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I would think the first time that I got stung by a jellyfish, I think I backed away from them from then. From yeah, them. exactly. I, I can appreciate that, that a lot. Yeah, there are a couple of <laughs> species. Um, so jellyfish's natural predator are usually uh, sea turtles. So sea turtles eat a lot of jellyfish and they are actually, uh, they don't get injured by the venom. So they're, uh -huh. they've protected themselves. They've evolved to be able to eat jellyfish. Very good. Yeah. I yeah. guess having all of those scales in their shell yeah. them protects them pretty well. Yeah. Um, one, of our, one of our watchers today is asking, why are jellyfish transparent? Like, why can you see through them? They're really, really beautiful. So like, what, but why, yeah. can, why can you see through them? Yeah, so uh, being transparent or almost completely transparent is a very good uh, defense mechanism for them. Uh, so they don't really need to worry about, um, you know, showing off to each other the way, you know, birds might. Uh, they don't really see color in that way. So uh, the best thing for them to do is to be almost transparent so that their predators can't see them. Mm. Yeah, it's a good yeah. protection. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So you, not only do you take care of jellies at the aquarium, but because you're a diver and you've probably, you know, <laughs> you've gone to different places to dive, somebody's asking, what is your favorite jelly and why do you oh, love Oh boy, <laughs> that's quite a question. Um, there are a couple answers. Uh, I, I'm most uh, excited by, uh, on like deep sea, uh, drilling sites or on deep sea exploration, they always come across really amazing deep water jellyfish species that uh, sometimes have never been seen before. There are a couple species down there that are really cool. Uh, Stygio medusa is one of my favorite because they can grow about as long as a school bus, about the same size. 
Uh, and deep staria is another one, which is about, it can grow to up to 10 meters across. So that bell is 10 meters. Yeah. So pretty cool deep sea jellyfish. <laughs> That is amazing. So jelly jellies are really neat. Like they go from they can yeah. be that big to very, very, very small. Exactly. Super that, tiny. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. One of the questions I people are asking as well, um, before I came on here is, and I think maybe you could help us a little bit, is describing to us kind of the life cycle of a jellyfish. Since you raise them, like how do jelly like how are jellyfish made? And how yeah. do they produce? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, male jellyfish and female jellyfish will both release gametes into the water. So reprodu reproduce out in the open sea, sort of like in a cloud. Um, and once those gametes meet, they form a little, almost like a little jelly bean. Like it's really tiny. You need a microscope to see it. Um, and then once that jelly bean kind of swims around a bit, it'll find a nice spot to sit. And so once it finds a nice spot to sit, a jellyfish will actually spend part of its life uh, completely immobile on the bottom. So it'll, it'll, it looks almost like a very small sea anemone. Um, and then that life stage uh, will actually reproduce in a bunch of different ways to uh, produce the next part of the life stage, which is a ephyra which is basically looks like a tiny little star or a little hand. And it swings around and slowly gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it turns into a medusa, which is what everyone kind of thinks of as a jellyfish. Um, we'll see if this can work. I do have a couple of the life stages here. They are quite small, as I mentioned, though. So hopefully we can see them a little bit. Um, so let's get this. Switched around. There we go. So, yeah, I think you might be able to see them a little bit. All those little pink things. Uh huh. Those are all polyps. Oh yeah, you can really see them on the side where the light is. There on yeah. the left side, you can see sort of little tentacly kind of things like coming out, right? Yeah, exactly. So they're yeah. really tiny. Uh, you need a microscope to do a lot of jellyfish breeding. Yeah. Um, we'll see about these guys. Not sure we'll see those, uh, but here we have little oh, Ephyra, little right. baby upside downs. Oh, look at them go. <laughs> I know, they're so tiny. Um, and when you compare them to the adults, right, they're very small. So pretty cute. That yes. is really, really cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's almost like you can almost sort of think about jellyfish reproduction in a way and had their life cycle almost like um like an insect life cycle right they go through yeah six stages where there's like an egg stage like for insects and a larval stage and pupa stage and jellyfish have really similar sort of markings of their life stages as well exactly yeah it's definitely like a full metamorphosis that they go through like significant changes to their body structure yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to, to the 10 meter across exactly jelly. right <laughs> absolutely that is a that is a big <laughs> thing for sure so then yeah that life cycle how long can a jellyfish actually live for yeah so it depends on the species um so we usually see with warm water species they don't live quite as long so the upside down jellyfish uh will probably live for around a year total um a year to two years um, with the moon jellyfish, uh, they live in the adult stage, that medusa stage, around six months. Okay. Um, and the sea nettles, they can live up to four years because wow. they're very, they're quite a cold water species. Nice. So yeah. it's colder the water, the, the better chances they have of living longer? Is that kind of Yeah, almost... generally. Um, it, obviously, there are exceptions to every rule, but uh, for the species we have in the building, at least, that's usually the rule of thumb. <laughs> And can sea jellies be found in all our world's oceans? Like, are they all over the world? They are all over the world. Um, you can see uh, the Pacific sea nettles, for example. You can see them all throughout the Pacific. Um, moon jellies are in pretty much every ocean in the world. Uh, they're even invasive in some places they're not supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> and there are even a couple of Arctic uh, lion's mane species as well. So they can, uh, they're even like freshwater jellyfish 
they're pretty much everywhere. Nice. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. So how many, how many jellyfish at the Ripley's Aquarium of Canada do you have to look after on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. So, uh, I take care of two of our exhibit tanks, uh, and then most of our baby cultures. So just for the adults, uh, that's around a hundred jellyfish, um, for the adults. And then I don't even know the number of babies in the hundreds <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. You don't see so hundreds don't and hundreds. So you don't give them all names or anything like that. No, I only <laughs> give the adults names sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good thing. It'd be very hard yeah. to pick up, I think, after a while. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. One of the things that people are asking too is about when we think of animals and species within the ecosystems as a whole, we always, always think about them having their place. Are they a predator? Are they prey? Like, what is the point of a jellyfish in our ecosystem? Where do they sort of fit into that greater picture? Yeah, so jellyfish are very important for their ecosystems. Uh, jellyfish are actually like a marker of how ocean health uh, kind of is doing. Um, you may have heard that uh, with ocean acidification or the temperature rising, we're seeing jellyfish blooms everywhere. Uh, it could be a function of people noticing them more, um, but jellyfish actually do quite well compared to other species in difficult conditions. Um, difficult ocean conditions actually cause jellyfish to reproduce more. So yeah, so as the ocean is not doing well, we do expect to see more jellyfish. Um, Plus, uh, they are a very important prey species, as I mentioned, to sea turtles. And as sea turtles are not doing as well, um, we see jellyfish getting predated on less. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so they, so just like, like when we think of um, our ecosystems here, there's always, there can be markers of certain types of um, different types of species and whether that species is rising in population or falling in population it can be an indicator yeah. of how of how well that ecosystem is actually functioning so yeah that's, exactly that's, that's really neat I I never thought of jellyfish as like a, a keystone species like that that yeah. would be an indicator <laughs> but yet now that you've explained that that totally makes sense absolutely yeah that's and especially really as uh, we see certain fish stocks not doing as well um, due to overfishing uh, we actually see examples of other predators trying to eat jellyfish. So there are examples of penguins uh, attempting to eat jellyfish, um, seals sometimes. Yeah, so Absolutely. a lot of species thinking, well, there's a lot of jellyfish. <laughs> Maybe I could eat those. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we've had another yeah. really great question come in here. Are there any freshwater jellyfish? Yeah, so there are some freshwater jellyfish. Uh, they are, they're the sort of evolution and genealogy, as it were, of jellyfish is a little bit complicated. So a distant relative of the true jellyfish, uh, which does look exactly like a jellyfish, um, <laughs> does, uh, does live in freshwater systems. We actually uh, see them invasively in Ontario. Um, there are cases of them appearing in lakes um, where they've accidentally been introduced. So, uh, yeah. I, I know um, I know. working at Science North, I've had people report to me saying, hey, I think I saw a jellyfish in a lake. I said, oh, yeah, yeah a jellyfish. And I, but I didn't realize that they were an invasive species in some, in some areas. So that's really... Yeah. So they are pretty small and they are completely transparent, but they do exist. <laughs> they do exist. And do they sting? Do they have stingers? Uh, I believe they do. I don't think it's a very bad sting, though. Okay. I've never been stung by one. I don't <laughs> believe it's a very bad sting, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that would definitely make sense. So yes. <laughs> somebody's dying to know, though. Somebody's dying to know, because you said you name some of the jellyfish. So you have to tell us one of the names of the jellyfish. <laughs> because I think uh, like all right so you gotta tell us how you name your jellyfish uh fair um well I can actually show him to you because he's right here in front of me oh great um so right here this is one of our holding tanks uh and in here is actually our first ever uh bred uh Pacific sea nettle so we've been having a lot of difficulties uh getting the culture up and running 
but we did successfully breed them finally in house. And this is our first baby. Um, so he's just, he's quite big now you can see, and he's just about ready to go on exhibit. Uh, but he is my child that I have raised. And um, I named him after the villain in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So his name is his name is Judge Doom, which is kind of a deep cut. There we go. That's and that that tank is circular as well. Is there? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, especially for the Pacific nettles, that circular shape is very important. Um, the flow. So you can see, sort of, uh, let's see, down there. And then up here are actually two places where water flow comes in. Um, so it creates this like very nice circular flow so that he never gets hit by any water that's coming in too strong. Uh, sort of, you just want very even flow over jellyfish. Yeah. yeah very gentle. <laughs> and how long does it, did it take for him to grow that big? Uh, so it took him, uh, I believe, he went into the Ephira stage, which is that very small stage I mentioned, uh, in January. So, oh, okay. so that's not very long at all. It's yeah. not very long. Yeah, he uh, has grown very quickly. That's fantastic. Oh, that yeah. looks, that is yeah. so, so neat. Well, is there anything else that we missed that you want to talk to us about or you want to show us, Sophie? Uh, I think we hit pretty much everything that I had in this room. Um, yeah. There was That's a lot going on. <laughs> and so I guess my last question for you is, what do you love most about your work and your job? Yeah, uh, my absolute favorite part has been working on the jellyfish breeding cultures. Um, we didn't really have anything set up when I started working in jellies. Um, so I was able to sort of build it all up from the ground the ground up. Uh, and it's been such a fascinating process learning about the life cycle figuring out all the little ways in which it can go wrong and go right and how complicated it can all be. So it's definitely been a challenge and it's been really fun working on it. I mean, and if somebody wanted to have a job like yours, what is, what is the one thing that you would tell maybe a young student or a high school student about where they could go or what they could do or work on to have a job of working like an aphorist? Yeah, so uh, one of the most important things is being able to scuba dive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which can be pretty hard to get into. Uh, there are a lot of good places in uh, Ontario even. Uh, a lot of our rivers and lakes have really cool wrecks. Um, so scuba diving is a big one. Uh, and of course, uh, any sort of biology is usually acceptable, even paleontology in, in my case. Uh, but working with any kind of animal can get you in uh, to a place like this. And a lot of passion, right? A lot of passion, yeah. A lot of passion, absolutely. Yeah, That's got to get really excited about jellyfish and think that they're adorable and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a plug now. The Ripley's Aquarium of Canada is now open, correct? Yes. So people can go visit you and your jellies and see everything yeah. you display at the, at the Ripley's Aquarium of Canada. So that is fantastic. Um, do you guys have any uh, rules in this COVID situation about coming to the aquarium that you want to share with people before they come? Yeah, so we do have rules. Um, we do have the mandatory mask rule uh, and you do have to book your ticket in advance as we only allow a very limited number of people in per hour. Uh, so you kind of have to schedule in advance, even if you're sort of a season pass holder, you just got to make sure you get a reservation in there. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So you can get in there and get to see all your amazing jellies. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sophie. This has of been course. really fun. I've loved, I love going to the back and <laughs> I of Aquarius and and I would be just beforehand I think one of the coolest things is that Sophie and I were talking about is where kind of the behind the scenes are located and in this case if you're walking it's all above your head right yeah <laughs> a lot of stuff right above your head that you'd never know <laughs> that you'd never know about that is pretty <laughs> neat that is pretty neat thank you again Sophie for joining today it's an absolute pleasure and uh, I can't wait to go visit the aquarium myself so I'm gonna have to make my way down there sometime this summer and come and check out all of your jellies and hopefully by that time your your baby jelly will be in the aquarium and of course hopefully <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you so much 
Oh, thank you. And I just want to thank everybody uh, out there who is joining us today for our live event. Thank you so much. We got so many amazing questions and who doesn't love to go and see sea jellies because they're part of my favorite animal. And uh, so just so, so you know, we are continuing these uh, blue coat talks uh, online, but Science North as of July 18th is also open to the public. We are open on weekends and just like the Ripley's Aquarium, we have time block tickets. So we're very excited to welcome you back to our science center as well and hope you'll make a visit and, uh, and enjoy some really great, amazing, uh, amazing science. So Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day.